Hello and welcome to an all new episode of Anime Brain Freeze. We are your ferociously fiery hosts. I am John. And I'm CC. And when there's just too much cool anime to watch, we've got you covered. Today we will return to the headquarters of Company 8 to review the second season of Atsushi Okubo's Fire Force. And since it's our season finale, after that we will give out our best of the season awards, as usual. But first, John is gonna dish out two mini reviews in our new section, The Quick and the Dead. So get ready for a hot mess of an episode, because let's be honest, that's just how we roll. And of course, don't pause the pod, we'll be right back! Right, so the quick and the dead. Uh, we kind of decided, we did this real quick last time, but we kind of decided to do this in lieu of having uh, a shows that we dropped segment. Uh, I mean, those might fall under the umbrella of this at some point in the future, but most of what we drop is what we say we drop in the uh, sneak peek at the top of each season. So mm -hmm. uh, that aside, this is for more of the... Uh, quick fire reviews for things that we watched and finished but don't necessarily feel like committing to a full review of so um i got two today mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, first is uh tony kawa which is uh short for tony kaku kawaii uh fly me to the moon uh and the show was you know it was about this sudden romance between these two characters one of the characters gets hit by a bus yeah and almost yeah. dies <laughs> but yes um and the girl he falls in love with is may or may not be kaguya princess of the moon which i alluded to in our last podcast mm -hmm. um it's pretty much all but confirmed but they don't really do much with it within the this season of the show which is like you know we have this all but foregone conclusion and it's just sort of sitting there on the table at the end of the season like okay i guess i guess that's it you're guess, constantly you know, waiting for the other shoe to drop yes mm. because um the girl sukasa is always making references to things like uh so the boy Nasa is always like, hey, we should go to a museum or this, that, or the other thing or see some historical sites. And because presumably it's the implication is that Tsukasa has been around for a long, long time. So she's seen everything there is to see. So when they go to see this – in this one episode, they go to see this old shrine and Tsukasa's like – yeah, it's not there because it was gone like hundreds and hundreds of years ago and heavily implying that, you know, like, oh, I was here when that was still here. So – and they sort of really breadcrumb that along and that – Nasa is a good kid. But he's a fucking dumbass and he, does, and he never seems to put two and two together. So we kind of get left hanging on that on that note at the end of the show. It's at least a very wholesome uh, romance between the two characters, and I didn't dislike it because of that, but boy, oh boy, um, Seven Arcs kind of phoned it in on the production side. Ugh. Like, I don't expect crazy Sakuga out of a slice of life with a twist story, but they had a real hard time keeping the characters on model from moment to moment, and it was a little jarring, so... <laughs> I mean, I don't think – I don't know if I'd call it a huge deal breaker, but it's noticeable and it's not great when you're noticing it so often. But everything else about this show is fine, I guess, and I don't think it's a show I would say, hey, don't watch this. But you know, you, you have you should probably be aware going into the um a friend of mine linked me to the manga back when it first started. I'm sure I said this before. Um, because it was created by the same uh guy who made uh Hayate no Gotoku. And I was like, Oh yeah, you know, I'll check out his new work. And, you know, I read a few chapters and I kind of fell off it, so I was really glad to see you gotten this anime adaptation. I just wish it got treated a little bit better. But yeah, is that, um, is that the biggest downside to it, or are there other gripes you have with it? Yeah, I think that's the biggest mm. sort of thing that grinds my gears about it. So, what's the biggest plus? 
biggest plus is that you know it seems to be pretty mostly pretty faithful to you know the manga from what i had read so i'm glad they at least kept true to the spirit that was there um Mm. there were a couple things in the manga that weren't there like (laughs) so hayate if you know was a very reference heavy comedy uh tony kawa in the manga is not like that but in the anime they, they they snuck a few things under the radar that were like all right I see you guys doing some goofy shit and that, hmm. I, I, I appreciate that. That's funny because there's, there's an early episode where NASA is trying to figure out, you know, how big of a bed would we need if we wanted to sleep in the same bed? And he's trying to, you know, do the math and the um, characters he pictures in his head laying on the bed are two characters from Danga and Ronpa. So I'm like, mm, uh-huh. mm, mm-hmm, 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 okay, but, but they're not. They're different colors, so it's okay. It's not the same. All right. <laughs> it's a reference, not a theft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 and I've said this before about Japanese reference humor. I like that. It's like, if you get it, you get it. It's not like, this is a, this is the reference. Do you get it? Ha. Yeah, it's not super in your face. There's even some of that, like, in, uh, in Jujutsu Kaisen that I really appreciate, where it's just like, yeah, there's some name drops here, but it's not. There's some Use. weird name drops. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, but it's not okay, because like, it's kind yeah, of funny. It's super on the side. It's like, it's yeah. not, it's not. oh my god, huh, he said that thing, or he said that thing. It's just like, yeah, it's just basic conversation, and it's it's funny. You know, especially Yuji does it a lot, in terms of also movie reference and shit like that. Mm. And, and the other one being uh, you, uh, Nobara. So uh, <laughs> those, two, those two dish out a lot of references, I think. Yeah, we get to that when we get to review of Jujutsu Kaisen, but <laughs> I also appreciate that. Mm. But yeah, um, if you want to watch Tony Kawa, it's on Crunchyroll, and you know if if you're not too worried about uh, how your how the characters look on screen, it's fine. It's fine to watch. It's okay. Uh, the other show is Love Live. Ni- uh, God, full title of the show: Love Live Niji Kasaki High School Idol Club. We're gonna call it Love Live Niji Gaku going forward because that's how that's... everyone else shortens it. It's already long enough. Yes. So this show, you know, again, it's love lives about school idols. It's about uh, trying to get the band back together when uh, the class president decides to disband the school idol club due to a difference in ideologies between the girls. And I mean, the band gets back together pretty quickly. But then a lot of uh, the story after that is um, each one of the characters' stories and trying to uh, see a little bit of what you know, what makes each of them unique in their story and their own individual stories, and trying to carve out their own unique identity as a school idol. Um, the show was, you know, it was fine. You know, it was uh, not as emotionally strong as sunshine but i also felt the way about the first season of sunshine and then the second season had me uh crying a fucking ocean worth of tears at the end Mm -hmm. i remember (laughs) but um this the big they kind of teased a second season because they had the big school idol festival at the end and um one of the characters kind of offhandedly says, wow, I guess you're going to have to do this again. And I'm like, oh, OK, gotcha. So so they still they still got time to got me. <laughs> hmm. um, the characters are there's a few characters that I really liked. Um, there's I guess I'll run down a few of them real quick. There was uh, this one character, Rena, who she's very sort of shy and introverted and she has trouble openly expressing herself like she's very she has one facial expression and it's just this neutral face and you know she kind of expresses herself with this uh sketchbook that she has where she draws different faces into it and puts it over her own face and you know her story is all about just trying to you know gain more confidence and be able to express herself more openly and making more friends. And that's why she wants to be, you know, a school idol. And it's, she's a character I thought I would at least be interested in, but she turned out to be 
really great. So it's always nice when you know a show and its character surprise you like that. Where it's like in the beginning you have a character and you're like, oh, is, uh, why is that character here? And then by the end it's like a favorite character. It's like, what happened? <laughs> yeah, writers, <laughs> tell me your magic trick. There's um, there's Kasumi who's. She's this little shit bird who she just wants to show everyone I'm the cutest school idol of them all. And it's like, okay, all right. And she starts off sort of very brazen like that. But then you sort of see that she's sort of butted heads with uh, one of the other gr girls, Setsuna, in a lot of her story ends up being like <sighs> coming to an understanding that I see that we wanted different things, but – I'm sorry that, you know, the two of us ended up – it was, you know, it was basically my fault that the school idol club ended up getting disbanded. And they, you know, come to this uh, sort of understanding and rekindling of the friendship. And, you know, that's really nice too. Mm. Uh, Setsuna is uh, secretly, not so secretly, the school council president – Mm -hmm. who disbanded the uh, club in the first place. And she has um, – she's trying to keep up this air of being very – of being very proper and, you know, the the upstanding uh, president of the, of the class. Um, when she really wants to do the idol stuff and get into her super nerdy shit that she loves, but – I th they don't really go super into it, but I think she kind of pushes those feelings down a bit because there might be something with her parents that uh, they expect of her, and they don't really go into that super hard. So that's why it gave me a, a, like a second season for maybe some of that, please. Mm. But um, it, there's some interesting potential for more story with her. Uh. But uh, yeah, this – I don't think this is the strongest Love Live has been, but it certainly had more interesting characters in it than I was thinking. I was just going into it being like, oh, this is, is going to be another Love Live, so I guess go watch it. Um, I will say this though. The CG keeps getting better. How? Oh. I mean like, I, uh, considering how bad it was, that doesn't necessarily – have to be a high bar, but no, I'm glad to right. hear it. But yeah, going from uh, the original to Sunshine was a big jump. This is, you know, maybe not a big, it, it, an equally big jump going from Sunshine to Nichigaku, but it does look a lot better in comparison. It's good to see that uh, Sunrise is, you know, putting in the work to make it look better and better each time. I appreciate that. I mean, I think that's not Sunrise, but let's hope that Zombieland Saga's. Uh... Second season won't have as much of distracting CGI as the first one did. So, I mean, I I originally thought that was for a certain purpose, but I guess it wasn't. Yeah. But so we'll have to see what happens. Mm. But yeah. Uh, I think on its own, Love Live Nichigaku is enjoyable enough, and it's it's kind of standalone from the previous series, so you don't need to. Where Sunshine. Does it set oh, itself up for a second season, though? A little bit. Okay. So they leave yeah, the I mean, door open a bit, but not necessarily going to do something with it. Right. It's mm. not like with Sunshine, where a little bit of it was predicated on knowledge from the original series. Nijigaku kind of stands on its own. Okay. Uh, but yeah, if you want to check that out, it is on Funimation now, and it's I think it's worth watching. Oh, um. They also sort of leaned a lot more into this show is a musical more than yeah. ever before because there is definitely a unique musical number every episode. <laughs> and they do that every time. And they're like, yep, nope. They just – they went full high school musical with Love Live. About time they did it. <laughs> I'm surprised they haven't done that specific thing yet, actually. I'm, I'm uh, kind of a bit shocked, actually. I mean, they did, but they didn't lean into it as heavily as mm. they did this time around. Okay. Uh, someone on Twitter. Does the whole point, school join in at some point? <laughs> no. Okay. No, we got we got that in sunshine. No. All right. Okay. But yeah, um, someone at one point on Twitter mentioned that uh, 
this show seems to take place in the what they described as the music video verse because when one of the girls breaks out into song the world around them seems to start changing into like you know like a music video type thing it's like oh this is mm, all right interesting <laughs> yeah we're just again full musical <laughs> full musical yeah uh i think it's enjoyable as it is uh if there's a second season where you get just a little bit more characterization and story, that'd be cool. I mean, I'm sure if I actually played the mobile game, I'd get it. But I play like one actual mobile game and everything else is daily puzzle games because I don't like to sink money into mobile games. Wait, you don't? I mean, listen, listen, Crunchyroll was kind enough to finally give me Princess Connect. Mm. So I'm happy. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, uh, Love Life Nijigaku is fun. Check it out on Funimation if you're so inclined. All right. I guess that's it for the quick of that then. Uh, wait, that's... Not, the... as, not right. as quick as I anticipated, but it's fine. Yeah, all right. <laughs> well then, let's move on to our uh, first and only full review for this episode. So, Fire Force time. We're back. Can't see it, but I'm throwing up the horns. That's significant. Oh, yeah. Corner time. <laughs> um, again, this is, of course, a continued series review. So, take note, people. This is going to be full spoilers for both seasons of Fire Force that have been released so far. Be aware of that. So, spoilers are go in three, two, one. Let's rock. Let's start <laughs> back into some hot shonen action. Wait, that came out wrong. Um, oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, Fire Force Season 2 kind of picks off pretty much where we left off. Uh, so, when Shinra Kusakabe joined Special Fire Force Company 8, he wanted to use his gifts as a third generation pyromancer to help save people from the ever present threat of spontaneous combustion, fight the infernal set spontaneous combustion victims had been transforming into, and discover a way to end his world's fiery nightmare for good. Ever since beginning their war against the nefarious forces of the so-called Evangelist, Company 8 has unearthed world-shaking secrets that make Shinra's mission even more critical. There are double agents everywhere in the Fire Force, for one, and Shinra has also learned that his brother and mother, who he thought was long dead in an infernal's blaze, are also agents of the Evangelist. With the fight more personal than ever, Shinra has vowed to not only end spontaneous combustion once and for all, but to find a way to save Infernals, including his mother, from their monstrous fates. This season gave us a lot more to chew on this time around. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, we ended on a kind of big banger where it's something we could assume, <laughs> you know, you could guess that his brother was still alive and there was something going on, but we weren't really sure if he was the... Uh, you know, uh, until that new OP has, I guess, that he was the leader, or at least some leader of the Evangelists, mm. one word or another. And that what was the reveal kind of at the end, what happened, and uh, yeah. And we're continuing on from there with, I guess, the Evangelists making some big moves right from the get-go. Mm. We get a lot, of, a lot of new characters introduced in the show. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much the first thing that happens. A new character is put on the field. Uh, that would be Inka. And mm. she's this thief that can sense where and when a fire will break out and use a de uses that to blackmail people in need of saving, which is quite shitty. Uh, and <laughs> we should give have given you a hint uh, where that character is going, but it's also like, hey, okay, maybe she'll join the Company 8 and she... We'll turn her life around and everything. Um, nope. <laughs> not not so much. Not I'm, so much. <laughs> to call Inca a uh, an agent of chaos, I oh, think, yeah. is probably the best descriptor Spot of her character. On. Yeah, she she thinks she is a fourth generation um, fire manipulator. I don't even know what they're called. Fourth generation fire user. I forgot Pyromancer. What, Pyromancer. Right. That's what they're called. And the thing that's also something we learn uh, this season, uh, like first generations become infernals through human combustion. 
Uh, second ge generation pyromancers can manipulate and control flames, and the third generation can ignite their own flames and their force and shape and mold it around them and shit like that and do some weird, crazy shit with it. And Shinra is a third generation. I think Arthur is too. Most of Company 8 are third generations, um, if I'm not mistaken. And Inka thinks, uh, thinks she's a fourth generation because she can't manipulate fire, but she, you know... Uh, is probably a third generation that hasn't fully awakened yet. So, uh, you know, fourth generations apparently are not supposed to control fire. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know how that, why that suddenly would abruptly stop. But yeah, that's how it works. She's kind of like Daredevil in the beginning, only with flames. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she she can kind of predict where something, some fire might break out, but also control it in a way like she is controlling like the, the strings of destiny or shit like that. And so She's kind of drawing a path to it. Yeah, pretty much. Tracing it sort of, I guess. Yeah, and can, you know, make it, make it, you know, happen at least to some extent the way she wants it to happen. Like she can, she can also predict enemy attack patterns through the scent of their attacks and stuff like that. So it's interesting. And what also is also interesting is the twist with her. Because I really thought initially it's like, yeah, she's kind of a shitty character, but, you know, that will be her arc. She will be turned around. She will join the Company 8 um, crew and then Shinra will help her become a better person than she is right now. And also, you know, in the beginning, how it's set up and with the evangelist trying to get a hold of her and everything, you expect her to be like this typical damsel that Shinra has to rescue because that's how Shonen works. But oh, yeah, no. <laughs> then she kind of decides to join the villains or rather resigns herself to what she thinks is her fate because it's also her thing. Like her, her seeing basically this, the threats of fate and following it and her, she believes that she... Like her reasoning could either be rooted in a wish to justify her evil impulses or she's trying to punish herself to to a deep-seated self-hatred that she needs to overcome first. I'm not sure which is it, but mm -hmm. it seems like over, like basically giving herself to fate or uh, considering this fate is her way to deal with it or to cope with it. But yeah, she killed her henchman slash buddy in cold blood. Um, <laughs> or should I say hot blood? <laughs> I mean, that was like, Jesus. Yeah, Cold Blood is kind of ironic given how she does it, but still. I'm not sure there is redemption waiting at the end of her story, and I don't know how, how much more development she'll actually get now that she has joined mm -hmm. the Evangelist, but she kind of appears on and on throughout the season, like has a bunch of spots where she does her thing, uh, but also the focus is on some of the other characters more uh, throughout the rest of the second season. But, I mean, she can kind of see the future and she sees that she will probably die of, uh, if she takes this path or at least end up with one eye and one arm, apparently. <laughs> mm. So there must be reason for her to pick this deadly path, especially since it contradicts her survivalist attitude that she displays at the beginning. So I don't know. That might also be a front as well. So we'll see. But there's definitely more to her than I expected at first glance. What did you... Where did you come down on when it when it came to her character? Did you like her? Were you like, oh, what was going on? <laughs> or I don't, I don't know if I'd say I like her, mm -hmm. but the way her story played out certainly made her more interesting than I thought. Because you know, I, I was having the same expectation. Oh, you know, she's gonna join Company A and blah blah blah, and then she's like, just very straight to Shinra. No, and I was like, oh. Oh, this is not going the direction I expected, but I do wonder how smart of a it's it, how smart of a decision that is for her. I mean, I don't, I, I don't see it ending well. So <laughs> mm, me neither. I mean, like I said, she kind of sees that it doesn't. So we'll see if that comes true. But yes, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of plot happening in season two. Like there's a bunch of big reveals that are coming and. Uh, bunch of background story we basically get filled in more and more uh, to the say the beginning of this world like the apocalypse and everything the big uh, cataclysm that happened and we like through these these small what do you call it paper cut um intro sections or whatever that get extended more and more and uh, fill you in more and more on what actually happened, uh, how right, yeah, yeah. Big, big fire happens, uh, how much the evangelists are responsible for it, and we get to that. But all that is connected kind of to Amaterasu, like the big 
reactor thingy in the middle of the city that basically um, supplies the city with all its energy and basically it's like this new form of energy a dollar or whatever it's called right yeah so i just want to say that uh i i haven't i don't think i've said this to you and i didn't say it anywhere on twitter or hmm. anywhere else because i didn't want to cause a big firestorm <laughs> <Ha>! <laughs> but um the Get story out. of raffles the first seem it reminds me of something else mm -hmm. and that something else is Gwyn in the first flame from Dark Souls. Interesting. I mean, There's I'm not a, super familiar with Dark Souls lore, so... There was a lot of parallels there where uh, Gwyn and a detachment of his knights entered the kiln of the first flame, and, you know, the, the fire is what brings life to the world of Dark Souls. And... I'm just every time they're talking about it, I'm like, Okubo, I think you may have copied somebody's notes a little bit. Like it's it's not, you know, a one to one, but I look at it and I'm like, this is getting the same vibe, dude. Or they might draw from the same kind of mythology that we are not familiar with, right? I mean there might be some common source there that they're that they, you know, both consumed or read in some way or you know, and are drawing from, and I don't know what came first. I don't know how old Fire Force is when compared to Dark Souls. If they came out of kind of the same time, like the manga anyway, and, uh, you know, in the first game. So, I don't know. I don't want to throw accusations, but that might be true. Absolutely. I mean... Well, Dark Souls is 2011, and the manga for Fire Force was 2015. So. Okay, well, yeah, then... The if someone if someone copied from someone, then Fire Force is definitely the guilty one here. But yeah, I can't say. But it's interesting. It's interesting that there's a, a commonality there. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's things that aren't in Fire Force that maybe we haven't seen yet. But, you know, like hmm. there was the Age of the Ancients in Dark Souls where uh, Lordran was ruled by dragons. And then the advent of fire occurred, causing a disparity between heat and cold, life and death, light and dark, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and then hollows came from the dark and all of that sort of stuff. So well, well, there, there, it's not a 100 uh, percent like one to one sort of thing, but th there's enough for me to be like, I, I, suspicious. I, I see, I see some things here. Well, on that note, since I'm not familiar with Dark Souls lore, is there something like the first, uh, like you know, we get introduced to this concept of the pillars in the season. It's like, which I don't really quite have a grasp on yet. What they are? Are they just very strong pyromancers? Uh, that's... that specific power and can do uh, have also have the power of a dollar burst and a dollar links, which means they have special uh, special ability, uh, very powerful flame powers, basically, and they also can communicate over te telepathy, which would be a dollar link, and can feel each other. And the first yeah. is is apparently the first that is that, and that might still be trapped in Amaterasu, and you know that that's the person or creature they used to make this new energy form happen. And apparently that happened throughout the globe. Uh, so yeah, is, is there something like that in Dark Souls where it's like this weird creature which might or might not be an alien, so a fire alien or something, like a burnish maybe, and that, that was responsible for kind of that new power introduced into the world and then was used by other forces, in this case the evangelists in uh, Dark Souls, this other night faction, uh, to do something with it uh, to help people, but also maybe bring ruin at the same time. I mean, there were different lords that gained uh, power from the first flame. Uh, here, I'll, I'm just going to read an excerpt from the Dark Souls wiki about the Age of Fire. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> With the dragons defeated, the lords took over the world. It was a prosperous era, and from it many nations were born. The land which the lords hailed from, Lordran, became the center of many adventures for those of other nations to engage in. The first flame became linked to the bonfires throughout Lordran and gave power to them. In time, however, the flame began to fade. Desperate to ensure that their age of fire continued and afraid of the coming dark, Gwyn did everything to keep the flame lit. They linked the bonfires to humanity. 
and shepherded the humans to kindle the flames. In contrast, the Witch of Isolith attempted to use her soul to create a new flame, but this did not work. Instead, birthing the bed of chaos and by extension, the creation of chaos and demons. That sounds very familiar. You're right. That sounds yes. really like something something that we're going to get to eventually in Fire Force. Where it's like, yeah, someone tried to save humanity, in this case probably Raffles, and uh, then kind of fucked it up if ultimately uh, by what they did. And uh, yeah, we'll see. That's interesting, though. We, we, especially you, should keep an eye on that. We'll see. Yeah, uh, so the current... Um, I mean just a, a quick thing dark souls is weird with its plot though because well all of the souls games it, with the exception of maybe like god sekiro which is you know only tangentially a souls game because there's no plot in the game you infer everything from the lore on I know. the items and on the characters that's what always put me off uh, off of it it's like Which, i kind of want a narrative i t i don't want to look through fucking wikis to know what the fuck is going on <laughs> i get that but i think it, it it does make it interesting in a way but i get that you you want the story there but when you're trying to especially i think what's interesting is when you know the games come out and they're new and people are trying to piece everything together. Like I remember when I first played the original demon souls, not, not this, not this PS five remake. Get this out of here. <laughs> the, the PS three version. Hey, it looks good. Um, oh no. Yeah, no, definitely. Play, if you're going to play demon souls, play the PS five <laughs> version. <laughs> but uh, when the PS three version came out and everyone was piecing together all of the lore in like this big giant puzzle about the nexus and Latria was like, damn or not latria uh bulletaria it's like damn this shit's wild and the way it all fits together is really interesting um and god one of the things that was really interesting about demon souls in this I, we, we have to get back on track to fire force i'm sorry everybody <laughs> it's all one right the, i love our the, tangents one of the interesting things about demon souls that's not in the remake and there's a technical reason for that is that in the original game you had these loading screens where you would see the different characters and sometimes you would see different interactions between them like there were t there's two um notable blacksmiths in demon souls that you know they have come to blows at several points and there's a loading screen with that and you see them fighting each other and the only reason that's not in the remake is because the game's on a fucking solid state drive now you don't need loading screens yeah, absolutely. It's, it's kind of cool, right? That you always can jump in right from the get-go, but I also miss, like, I recently played Spider-Man Miles Morales, and I miss the rides on uh, the subway train where Spider-Man talks to just fucking random New Yorker people. And <laughs> uh, that was so charming in the original Spider-Man game, and that's, of course, not in there anymore because it's zip, and now it's done loading. So why would you do that? So, so yeah, I think... This will be the last thing about Soulsborne, but I think the parallels between it and Fire Force are interesting. Yeah, but I, I think that Okubo took he. I think what he did was he took the parts that he liked and was like, "I'm gonna use this as inspiration." And you know what? That's cool. I'm not. I'm not gonna say, "Oh, he's a fucking dirty plagiarist." No, he liked. He definitely took what he liked and he f twisted it to fit the narrative he wanted to write. I just think that it's interesting to look at Dark Souls from this perspective and see, oh, you can see the parallels and the mm. things that he wanted to do with his story. Definitely. So, yeah, uh, the current plan of the Evangelist seems to be to gather people with a dollar bursts and cause another cataclysmic event like 250 years ago. Which mm -hmm. after, you know, all the stuff with Raffles uh, happened and stuff like that and, you know, creating the Great Flame and, and Amaterasu and yada, yada, yada. So, yeah, that's basically their plan that they're trying to amass new knights, new people, join their ranks and stuff like that. That's from the evangelist point of view, that's most of season two, really. And on the other side of things, we have Company 8, who's kind of trying to find out what is happening. Basically doing a bunch of shit like... First, they are fighting the evangelists, uh, you know, in the city, and then they're going on a joint operation to China, uh, where some weird things are happening. And 
where the gang is getting high on gas, which is pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, really enjoy. I mean, Fire Force in general is a funny show. I mean, some comedy really doesn't work, and we'll get to that in the end of the fucking review. But um, some cool shit in China. There's, you know, there's some remnants of our world, uh, like cars overgrown by trees, which was very visually striking, and mm. we hadn't seen that much, you know, nature stuff. And, you know, yeah. there's some actual animals there, and which is a super rare thing. I mean, also that they talk, or at least mm. one of them. But, you know, that's also a thing with, with uh, you know, that's Vulcan's thing, where it's like, hey, uh, you know, before the big fire, uh, a lot of Earth was populated by animals, and I want to I wanna see those animals again and bring them back to life and make the earth hospitable again for them. So seeing this kind of completely different part of the earth, uh, aside from the, the big cityscape, like steampunky cityscape that we've seen so far, mostly, this this was uh, this was a pretty cool diversion. Yeah, it was, you know, of course we knew all along that there was the Greek cataclysm, but I guess I didn't quite understand until they went to uh, the what do they call it? the tabernacle? Yeah. Um, when they went there, just how fucked the rest of the world actually was, because I mean, there's nothing there except no. for that. Most parts of the world are just peninsulas now. Yeah. It's just basically this very small islands here and there, and that's it. There's nothing else left. And then you have these big cities uh, in certain parts, and that's it. And yeah, it's it's really kind of scary when you realize that. Like you said, there were hints, you know, with what Balkan said in the beginning, and just, you know, some small world building here and there in season one. But now we get a real grasp on what that actually means and what the world looks like. And it's harrowing. And you know, like, yeah, that was a... There was some really horrible shit happening. And I assume eventually we're going to have our flashback with some part of the um, evangelists that fill, on, uh, fill us in in all of the in the original story because let's be honest we can kind of assume that part of the story that we hear at the beginning of the episodes you know where it's like hey this happened to raffles and stuff like that part of that is probably bullshit <laughs> and you know there's some some truth behind that that might have happened but also i think there's some that's some spin on the story that actually didn't happen in parts and there's some twists come uh that that will uh you know that might still jump uh, from around the uh, jump in from around the corner so yeah i'm i'm interested i'm looking looking forward quote unquote to the flashback episodes where we actually see like a live report from someone who was alive during the great cataclysm and watch that shit happen Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's probably going to be terrible. <laughs> but without yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, uh, and so far, you know, the the uh, these picture book prologue segments uh, have been trying to fill us in, and we see how much of that is actually true. The the common thing is, it seems like one woman is responsible for it. That the first pillar, apparently, we haven't really learned that much about her, aside from her later appearing in Shinra's mind space, kinda. With her, uh, you know, a dollar link and talking to him and trying to convince him to give into his urges and to come over to her side and stuff like that. It's not really clear what her motivation is yet. Maybe she seems to be, you know, the, 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 the driving force behind the evangelist, but also she has maybe her own agenda. Does she really want the new cataclysm? Does she want to, uh, to do something else? I, that, that All of that has not really been made clear yet. Only we only get hints in this season, and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Basically, for those two factions, kinda it's like, hey, evangelists trying to you know amass new people, new powerful uh, pyromancers, uh, maybe try the rest, uh, or they are actually trying to find the rest of the pillars. I think, wait, how many pillars are there supposed to be? Right now, there's six. There are eight pillars apparently. They have found yes. six. And they're trying to find the other two, I think. So, mm -hmm. and Shinra seems to be one of them. Haumea, who we have already met in the first season, is one of them. Sho is one of them, uh, Shinra's brother. So we got some pretty prominent and powerful um, characters in this show already being like the key factors or, or, you know, the key components that apparently factor into reliving or restaging the Great Cataclysm. So we'll see what how that turns out. It's going to be a hoot, probably. Mm. Mm. And yeah, there's some other 
characters and faction that factor into all of this one of the more important ones or two of the more important ones we actually you know get two very important factions in this one being hijima industries who kind of supply all of the fire force with their tech but also have some let's say maybe not so nice or rather very sinister goals uh, spinning in the background um uh it's <laughs> i <laughs> It's hard to get a grasp on what they're what they are actually trying to do as well in this season. I just know that their president is playing Game Boy all the time. Yeah, what's up with that? I don't. It's cool. <laughs> it's uh, he's going legit old school, and he's very de- dedicated to finishing those levels. So I I can respect it, I guess. But <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. So uh, the, they are a big part, and some part of the. Um, of the story is Company 8 dealing with them, and then again the evangel- evangelist attacking that, and that turns into a big three-way battle royale. And um, yeah, then we also have the Holy Soul Temple, which was, at least according to legend and to scripture and everything, created by an evangelist. We don't know which one yet, really, um, who posed as Raffles, the guy who you know, the who was the saint that created Amaterasu and gave the world new life and shit like that. And then Evangelist posed as Raffles and created the Holy Soul Temple to steer people towards believing in the power of Adola and everything. Basically using that power and everything. And uh yeah, becoming a source for it as well. And basically subjecting themselves to that power. So that Holy Soul Temple seems to be just a bunch of fanatics and mm-hmm. We have some characters clashing with them, and we got to that then uh, because that's also fun, smart. But that's more of a s- small s- side tension, like two or three episodes maybe, where they are more important. Get backstories on two characters in that regard, or one character finally. No mm. two actually, yeah. um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we we get to once we get to the character section, uh, which we can actually do right now. But yeah, that's basically this. That's the story of this uh, of the season. It's like we get some small, more small vignettes and some big clashes here and there between you know the evangelist and the uh, and Company Eight, and then Hajima joins the ring at some point, and we have a small side story where two other characters fight the Holy Soul Temple. That's basically it. I kind of forgot what we actually end on. And plot-wise, like, was there a big reveal at the very end? Oh, uh, yeah, well, there was a crucifixion. But, but yeah, it's there's some, you know, small side reveals, like Captain Burns might be a bad guy, could be not quite clear yet. He was a bad guy at some point, it seems, because, yeah, you know... His, his motives are not 100% clear. No, not really. Like, the OP kind of teases or alludes to that him and Shira mm. might clash again, but then again, he was his mentor, and they've been fighting on a regular basis, so... Yeah, it's not... He seems to be the one who saved Shinra and gave him guidance after his mom turned into an infernal, apparently, and, you know, his brother was taken away by the by the evangelist, but also maybe Burns gave his brother to the evangelist, so we don't fucking know. Uh, but I assume we will get filled into that in the third season. But yeah, speaking of Shinra, let's get to the character section. So his kind of thing in this season is that he is wrestling with his inner demons, literally. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, since he found out that the demon he deemed responsible for all the shit that happened to him was actually his mom, he doesn't know where to direct his pent-up anger and is easy prey for the first pillar, whoever that is. And like I said, she constantly invades his mind, kind of, and tries to steer him into a certain way and tries to try to push his buttons and everything. And yeah, that's kind of what he has to deal with this season, unless I'm forgetting something else. But I think that's mainly it. And aside from that, it's like he's there when... You know, some of the plot happens. John, am I missing anything? No, I mean, that's... Things... There are things that directly happen involving Shinra this season, but this isn't, like, his story this time around. It's, it's all of these other things that are happening around yeah. him, and he's trying to, you know, figure out what's going on, trying to deal with uh the first pillar, who I have my suspicions about. I'm not sure about you. Mm. But um, I'm sure we'll find that out in due yeah. time. I don't want to make assumptions, other you know, for some people who maybe don't, you know, so, so that still be a surprise. But we'll see. And also, mostly, my assumptions are wrong. So, 
<laughs> we'll see. It's just that they might be, you know, legitimate in the moment, but I, I usually end up being on the wrong side of things. See My Hero Academia. Oh, speaking of My Hero Academia, um, like Shinra, while in the first season he was like this kind of, hey, I'm just gonna fucking storm into battle and do hero shit because that's what a hero does. He does more smart he makes more smart decisions when it comes to mm. fighting in the season like he the from the get-go when they have the big fight in the first couple of episodes against the evangelist with this new you know big guy um who's kind of the caretaker of homea um his name is karen mm. and who's like this super powerful dude who kind of uses his voice as well i think his voice or his aura i'm not sure to actually repel people and everything and he's fun, he's big, he's brutal, and uh, Shinra <laughs> kind of, when fighting him, is able to calmly analyze the way Karan fights and uses his energy to actually find a more useful way to fight him when he realizes what Karan's powers and everything. So, uh, or Karan's powers. And that's kind of cool. And I hadn't seen that in season one, I think, as much anyway. And it reminded me of Deku from My Hero Academia and how he fights. So it's nice. Yeah, definitely. Um we there's definitely a lot of uh shinra learning that he has to be smart about mm -hmm. things and I, I appreciate that you know it's it's not big but no. it's not insignificant exactly it's like the small things small small parts of the battles where you notice like oh yeah he's actually you know taking his surroundings into you know into consideration he actually looks at how the uh, the enemies fight and doesn't try to do all the same shit all the time and knows okay no i need to be faster here i need to be quicker in that regard i need to do that instead of that and yeah it's cool and he gets his rock and roll on like he uses the, the you know the chorus sign to knock Karon flat on his ass <laughs> and uh we get a sh sh basically a shin rider kick so it's kind of cool Oh, um, get out. <laughs> not for long though. Like that the immediately after that uh, after that 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 corner thing, he gets a brutal two hit wake up combo by Caron, which made me literally yell out, Oh shit, oh god, in front of the screen. <laughs> it looked painful. Yeah, oh man. But man, Shinra and Caron had some of the best fights this season. Like the mm -hmm. one where uh, it, they go through the building and yeah. it's not like it's not like a shot from the outside no the the action follows them into the building it's just a really dynamic sequence it's like yeah fuck david production does some awesome work yeah yeah it's it's really cool and i've, n I've never seen something that as dynamic i think in terms of camera movement in jojo's mm. although there's some great dynamic camera shots in those shows as well but you know that kind of reminded me of a scene from uh promare uh, it just feels a little more, a bit more clean cut uh, than Promare because Promare is just visual overload all the time, mm. which is fun. Don't get me wrong, but you know it feels a bit more clear and thus maybe a bit more impactful in Fire Force when they go through the building and the way Caron lands as well is like, yeah, da -da 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 and then he just stands on the top of the building with like just stops <laughs> still and it's it's pretty damn cool. If you can find that GIF. Uh, Try to search out all that scene on YouTube or something. It's really cool. Uh, I, th or I think we already mentioned it in the sneak peek when we talked about the second season. Because I think it's in the first or second episode. And it's really cool. And there yeah. are a bunch of cool fights in this show. Again, Fire Force, just from an action perspective, woof. Really, really <laughs> cool shit. And especially the fire effects. Like, David Production put so much, much effort into making fire look good on the show, which is important because a lot of the fighting in the show is done with fire in mm -hmm. some way or another. So yeah, it's it's really cool. It's really great to look at. It's it's a lot of fun. And if you like shonen action anime, um, there is a there are plenty of reasons to uh, watch Fire Force for you alone. But of course, that's not the only that's not the only forty of the show. There are a bunch of cool characters. Let's get to my. Favorite one of the show, probably, who doesn't really get a lot of character development or anything in general. There is some in the show, we'll get to that. But he's just he's just the best character. I, I'm sorry, I can <laughs> Arthur is Arthur is without a doubt <laughs> the best character. Pro maybe possibly the best character in a show and anime I've seen in a long time. Not in you know, like the best, but he's up there. Like he's just 
he's just a joy. Every scene he is in is kind of gold. I'm always happy when he's on screen, when he's doing something, when he's saying something, because it's so incredibly dumb. It's so goofy, but he is so, so sincere. He is so fucking sincere. <laughs> that sells it. He he's he has his conviction. He's going to stand oh, yeah. on those convictions. And we learn why. We learn why Arthur is so prone to indulging in his delusions in this season. It's a uh, sad, like it's it's a bit a tidbit sad of a backstory with him being abandoned by his parents, but him going mm. full LARP is hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 this kind of great. And then they go to China, and then it turns out. Is Arthur maybe a mathematical genius? Oh because my he has god! Memorized pi because he's a member of the round table. <laughs> but he has no idea what pi or round table means. We just pulled that out in oh, was it was it Victor and um Are we not? I don't think it it wasn't Vulcan, was it? Maybe? I don't know if Vulcan was Victor. with them when they went to China, actually. I no, he I think he did. Yeah, I think he did. It might have been Vulcan. Yeah. Uh when uh, Arthur just like straight up says, "Yeah, this is Pi," to Victor and Vulcan, and they both look at him like, "Uh, I'm sorry." And he's just like, "Yeah," and he just is pointing out the different sequences of numbers, and he recognizes all of them. That's just like, this is the one thing you know. <laughs> yes, possibly the only. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good, and I, I, I just that made me laugh so hard. Like, Almost everything Arthur does makes me laugh hard, but he's also so very charming and his beef with with uh, with Shindra and everything, it could be super annoying, but it's also kind of fun because you also realize, also they show that in the ED, that they really care for each other in a, uh, in a way. And I don't know, it, Vulcan summarized it perfectly at some point in the show by saying, thank goodness Arthur is so dumb and boy is he right. So <laughs> I can't really... <laughs> Can't really add anything more to that uh, in terms of this character, but he's weirdly not shallow, but also he is. But in general, Arthur is just a bunch of fun. Like if you if you want to see a, like basically a poster child for a fun side character, I think Arthur is it. It's just I love that character. I think he's fantastic. He's but we also yeah, he's great. Um, but we also had like I said, we get a plethora of new characters introduced in this season as well. Uh, there's Captain. Uh, Holger, I think that's how he's pronounced in the show of the uh, sixth company, or is it Hog? I'm not sure. I think it's supposed to be like Hog. Oh. Well, they say it Og, but I think it's like Hog. Um, okay. Yeah, the commander of Company Four. Is it four or six? It's four. Okay. Yeah, he has a few screws loose um, and seems to be a masochist. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, Probably because he saw the truth, quote unquote, in the Great Fire or came close to it. Um, I don't know how he did it, though. But yeah, he's a, a weapons master and loves being used as a shield by Arthur uh, <laughs> so that he can take the pain and enjoy it, you know, because, like I said, he's a masochist. It's funny stuff. I mean, yeah. What's not funny is uh, Hawk, uh, bas uh, Hawk basically getting crucified in the last episode, which yeah. was quite a shock. I didn't see that coming, and we don't really know who did it yet, do we? No. Yeah, it's just it happens, and it's kind of sh it's shocking because he was kind of he was a super weird character, but he was endearing, and he his battles kicked ass. So, uh, it's he kind was, of a bummer. He was the kick-ass old man. He was yeah, he was dope. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, so we get him, uh, we get acquainted with uh, kind of new characters, which were already, I think, introduced in season one, but now get the spotlight like Juggernaut, mm. who can shoot uh, off fire missile, uh, missiles and has something weird going on with his body. Yeah, and he has some great fights and some real, he's part of one of the big emotional parts, uh, big emotional high points when it comes to battles in the show. Like his fight against the Whip Lady is awesome. And yeah, his you know, there's some part where he has to overcome his fear and everything because he's kind of a country bumpkin boy and you know does doesn't really have that much confidence and everything. But then you know he steps up to uh, to the call in one battle and it's pretty damn awesome. Not only animation wise, but definitely animation wise. And then there's Ogun, who is this badass who can create a plethora of different fire weapons. 
but also enhance his physical strength by applying flamey ink to his body. And when he lets loose against the demon Infernal, it's... Whoa, it's a sight to behold. <laughs> we also get a goddamn Jojo reference with him, so yeah. there's that. Oh, yeah. They knew what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mudas were had. Or Oras. I don't know. It was Oras. <laughs> I'm pretty I sure think. it was Ora Oras. Ora Oras, yes. But yeah, those are some of the new side characters who, again, don't play a super important role aside from their own little stories. But it's nice that they're there and they're fun and everything. They don't do that much, well, for, except for one character, maybe. They don't do that much with the already established characters in the show. Iris, after learning that the evangelists are behind the Holy Soul Temple, she has a crisis of faith, but they don't do that much with it, really. Maki gets, you know, gets some, we get some insight on her, which is pretty nice at the back end of the uh, show, which is, um, we learn about her and her family. Her family is kind of great, except for her brother, who is an idiot. But uh, mm. in general, they I, I felt like uh, kind of bad when watching them together because they kind of feed into her already damaged body image, which is like she's constantly like she's, you know, like we established in season one, she's super muscular and she's battling with that because she kind of wants to be more feminine, but she has her reasons for being, you know, more muscular and trying to stand on her own and everything and being a, a strong fighter. But instead of supporting her, they her family treats being buff like a flaw, you know, instead of praising her for her dedication. And also they put her kind of in a golden cage, and yeah. that's a shitty macho attitude, and I think that's what her brother does mostly. And it's kind of it's super unnecessary because she can handle herself perfectly well. So I was like, kind of like... On the one hand, I get it because, mm. you know, you're trying to keep your daughter slash sister of, safe from of, harm. But at the obviously. same time, she can handle herself. Exactly. Very well. She's a great fighter. And also, respect your child's wishes, you dumbasses. Like, yeah. how you might you might lose her eventually if you keep doing that. But yeah, that also has kind of a satisfying end, at least, uh, that little story arc for her. And I like Maki. Maki is also a great character, one of my favorite ones in the show. Mm. She's a lot of fun. She's very capable. And her fight scenes always kick ass. Like, she can kick major ass in general. <laughs> she's she's really good. I was happy that she got a bit more of a spotlight uh, when she didn't so much get one in season one. But yeah, you know, those were kind of our heroes. We also have more neutral characters that, you know, get a bit expanded upon in this, in this show and get even more screen time than, you know, our let's say, main hero characters. We finally get a glimpse of what Victor's and Joker's deal is. Mm. Um, they want to uncover the truth behind the fals falsified teachings of the Holy Soul Temple, but they don't think going through proper channels will do the trick, so they are running their own little rogue operation, which we were wondering about in Season 1. What actually We knew that uh, Lich was, a, was kind of a spy who infiltrated the uh, Eighth Company, but we didn't really know what he was trying to do, and especially not what Joker was trying to do. I love when Victor finally out and says it to Company 8. Yeah, I was hired by Hygiene as a spy. They just look at him straight on, and they were like, yeah, we figured that out. <laughs> just yeah, just like straight away, and he's like, oh, oh mm, okay. <laughs> I'm bad at being a spy. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, uh, you know, uh, Joker at some point joins up with Benny Maru, you know, who we've also met in season two, because he assumes correctly that Benny Maru has no love for the Holy Soul Temple, since all other religions have been kind of fused or collapsed into uh, the teachings, the scripture of the Holy Soul Temple, and Benny Maru and his people are the only ones still clinging to their old beliefs, because of that they have become an oppressed people. And Binimaro is definitely not happy with that. So makes him a very suitable candidate to join up with Joker, who wants to unearth the truth behind all that shit. And I kind of want a spin-off of Joker and Binimaro just wrecking havoc after, <laughs> after <laughs> Hell yeah. those episodes. Yeah, their team-up is so fun and the dynamic is pretty cool. Them giving each other shit a bit, but also being kind of sympathetic to each other's, uh, you know, agendas and everything and motivations. And the fights are kick-ass. Like, some of the best visuals in this second season are when Joker and Binimaru fight the Knights of the Holy Soul Temple. 
Mm. And we learned that Joker was trained as an assassin for the Holy Soul Temple as a child and suffered a lot of abuse. And there's a tragic backstory, like when he flees at some point, he gets taken in by a nice family, which is immediately killed by assassins from the Holy Soul Temple. So, Oof. yeah, it's, it's gruesome stuff, but we immediately understand why he does what he does. And I think, who's the guy, was Burns the one who trained him when he was uh, in the Holy Soul Temple? Because I'm pretty sure he was. I'm pretty sure, yeah. Yeah. So, at least... Burns was work, working for the temple at some point. The question is, is he still? Is he trying to stop, you know, Joker and and uh, and Barry, uh, Benny Marr and everything? As or does he does does he d not want the truth come to light? Has he since cut ties with the Holy Soul Temple? Or that that will be interesting to find out in the future. Yeah, but the fights against the Holy Soul Temple with Joker and Benny Marr are, are great. Like there's this scene where basically Joker douses the assassins from the temple with. Uh, LSD like through the smoke of a cigarette to beat them which is genius obliteration through contact high <laughs> man what's in your smokes joker can I yeah yeah <laughs> visually wise uh, visually wise that's also the reason why that is one of the most interesting scenes because it gets really crazy yeah. <laughs> at that point in the show it's super fun it's super fun to look at but you earlier speaking about how Licht revealing himself to be a spy to the 8th and they like yeah we figured that out he kind of only tells a ha like only tells half of the truth there because he says he's a spy for Hajima, which they have already figured out anyway, like you said. But he does reveal that he's in cahoots with Joker, mm. which is kind of, in my uh, opinion, smart play to gain their trust. He's like, "Hey, I I opened up to you, but also I still have my own thing going on aside from being a spy of Hajima because he's also playing Hajima. Like he's only joined them to." to reveal the truth behind the Order of the Holy Soul Temple. Also, he probably wants to reveal what is going on because, because the closed doors at Hajima and everything. Mm. So he, he, he has basically dedicated himself to revealing the hidden truth of the world. That's his thing. Yeah, because I mean, um, it's weird because he's on both sides, but he's only playing one side. And mm. I, I wonder, I wonder how that will work out for him and if he'll change if he, you know, wants to play both sides or switch to the other at some point. I don't know. Yeah, I wonder where his ultimate allegiance lies. Like, I mean, ultimately, it seems to be with Joker and what he was trying to do, but that might also be uh, only a um, partnership born out of necessity and convenience than actual, you know, those him having any kind of, I don't know, strong feelings towards Joker in regards to friendship or anything. And he spent so much time with the Eighth and, just, you know, being welcomed and everything. So he might shift allegiance there, ultimately. We'll see. It's interesting. And he's a fun character. Mm. But yeah, um, the last set of kind of maybe villains, but also maybe not villains, so more neutral characters, I guess, are Kurono and Nataku from Hajima. And Kurono... Pfft, he is a super creep. He just what? He's so weird, because he... It's clear he kind of cares about Nataku. Yeah. But he also wants to punch down on everyone. So when he gets caught up in the middle of the fight with everybody else, he's like, yo, everybody here is stronger than me. I'm, f I'm fucking out. It's like, <laughs> it's like, all right, so you know the limit of your strength, but come on, man, really? Yeah, you're right. He always wants to punch down. He enjoys that. He, uh, he enjoys kind of oppressing weaker people than him, like bullying weaker people than him and that's it makes him a super shitty character um yeah. but also at some point nataku who uh is like this child that gets experimented on by hajima, hajima and uh, has like these we uh, also these weird pyromancer powers and everything that he can't really control but you know trying to learn to but he's very uh, very low confidence and everything and basically gets abused by Kurono pretty much but at some point in the battle he tells Nataku that it's okay to be weak he likes him weak that's what he tells him it's like you don't have to try so hard you don't have to be the best at everything it's fine if you're weak which he does he does tell him that for selfish reasons 
but it's ex- it's still exactly what Nataku has to hear at that yeah. point. Since since he was pressured his whole life to improve himself, he needs to know that being weak and not living up to expectations is fine. And the only person who at this point is willing to tell him that, even though, like I said, for selfish reasons, is weirdly enough Kurono. So it's this super weird dynamic where it's like, Kurono's a really horrible person, but he does a really good thing for Nataku. So I I, I agree with you. I don't know where to come down uh, on, on one side when it comes to his character, because he's really, he's really easy to hate, but then he does a really good thing for this one character. It's, uh, it's that's really nice. So, um, yeah, he's he's interesting. Let's let's call it that. Yeah. And his match with Shinra is pretty damn cool. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh man, uh, the way his uh, smoke works. That's some. Jeez, like he doesn't have like. I guess not really fire power per se. It's just a manipulation of smoke to create illusions and weapons for himself. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's pretty neat to see, and he has a creepy face and everything. So. Uh, oh, he used to call himself Uncle Reaper for a, a reason. Mm-hmm, definitely. <laughs> but yeah, so that is our neutral faction, I guess, who don't necessarily have uh, an allegiance with either the really good or the really bad side and, and instead are trying to do their own th- thing. And of course, we have the evangelists, which are kind of the villains. And we already talked about Inca right from the get-go because she's the first new character that is introduced and kind of sets up the beginning of season two. So I thought I would put her first. But of mm. course, you know, some of the other ones are coming back. You know, we get new ones like Karon, but Haumea is coming back. And she has always been fun since season one. She's like this this delightful trickster who enjoys what she's doing, but also seems to be the smartest person in the group and everything and seems to have a master plan. She kind of does what she wants. So Karon actually has to team up with Shinra to protect the pillars since... Homea doesn't really care at some point if they get hurt or not. <laughs> so it's it's really fun. She's she's kind of a just like Inka, she's more of an agent of chaos than anything else. And mm. um yeah. That also kinda <laughs> it cements again Karon as a badass when he almost blows up the moon. Uh so <laughs> Mutin Roshiing it right there. And yeah, we also get reacquainted, let's quote unquote, with Giovanni, who is one gross, creepy motherfucker. <laughs> uh, we we kind of could assume things from what we learned about him in season one and his dealings with Vulcan and everything. But yeah, they definitely expand on that. And it's wild and gross. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of interesting characters that they necessarily do... They don't do really interesting things with all of them. A lot of them are just there to fight. Mm. And yeah, that's that's probably one of the downsides of uh, Fire Force that I felt, you know, creeping up when watching this season. Like most Jonan titles, Fire Force suffers from too many character syndrome, I guess. At least in parts. Like the stuff that heavily plagued My Hero Academia in its fourth season is also very apparent here. Instead of concentrating on developing their existing awesome characters, like, let's say, Obi, like, say, Arthur, they do something with Maki, which I really appreciated. Mm. But mostly they just rely on, in, you know, in constantly introducing new characters, which is fun to look at because the character designs in Fire Force are also very striking and very diverse. Power sets are very diverse and everything. So it's definitely fun to look at. But you're always waiting for, yeah, okay, there's a new character, there's a new villain, there's a new neutral character, and you get Kurno and Nataku. Those are all fun characters, they're all cool. But I always wish they would do more with their core set of characters. We haven't really learned that much about the main core of the command from um, Company 8 yet. Like, I assume there's still stuff coming about Obi, about... um, Hinawa? Hinawa, I think, yeah. And, uh, you know, we got something uh, about Maki... Maybe Arthur won't get any development. Let's be honest, that's not his thing, I guess, or he doesn't need it. But you know, I I I, I still wait for some of some more for them to do some more with their core characters instead of just throwing new characters at, uh, at us. You know, like I said, Maki get a bit, gets a bit of development. Even Joker does, and you know, it took Naruto until Shippuden, so three hundred episodes or something, to give one of the, its best characters, uh, Shikamaru, a good arc which was arguably one of the best arcs in the whole series, to be honest. 
And so I'm willing to give Fire Force some, you know, some rope here and be like, yeah, okay, some leeway. Uh, you still have time. But right now, they don't really seem to be too interested in doing that much with their main crew or, you know, with, with the most interesting side characters or stuff like that. It's a lot of cool shit that we get. It's a lot of cool things. And like I said, cool new characters that get small arcs. But I'm still waiting for, like, the big development stuff with Iris, with uh, with Maki, with Obi, with, uh, you know, with Shinra, obviously, and everything. So I hope they actually will do that in Season 3 uh, whenever that comes, uh, mm-hmm. instead of, you know, just throwing, again, a bunch of new characters at us and new uh, evangelists. Don't get me wrong, they can still do that, but also do the other thing where you further develop your main characters because, you know, that's what the focus still should be on in my opinion yeah and i yeah. 100 agree with that yeah and speaking of that uh-oh, uh, uh-oh. one of the like the biggest sore thumb in the season again like in the first one is tamaki sadly yeah. who is a core character and still has this stupid ass gimmick where her clothes fly off, and now she's also a nun, like a sister. So just so maybe that they can add a new fetish to her dumb gimmick, I guess. It feels because I don't that see way. any other reason. Yeah, it feels like it because I don't see any other reason why they would do that because she doesn't really have a motivation to be that. She is still a fighter. She can still support the 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 crew in another way and. They actually do something with that at the very, the very last episode or something, uh, in that regard, which I appreciated. But like, uh, her fan service jokes still suck, man. They are not even funny. No. So what's the point besides showing her naked? And since it's played for laughs, it's not even sexy. So again, what's the point of this? <laughs> it's played for laughs. It's not funny. It's not sexy because it's played for laughs. So stop it. <laughs> And Firefox can do good jokes. Like I said, it, it, it has shown this time and time again. Case in point, spoofing the trope that all the red shirts of the second unit die right after getting married or having a kid. You know, the old only one day away from retirement trope. And, you know, one was looking forward to trying on a brand new pair of sneakers. See, that that is clever and funny. Tamaki fan service jokes are not. So... Neither are the jokes making fun of Maki being buff and being insecure about it. Just by the way, right? We don't no. need that in here as well. It's not It's not funny. It's just kind of demeaning. And the fan service jokes on Tommy's ends are very demeaning, uh, demeaning as well and are also not funny. Like nothing about this one. It's the same joke over and over again. It's not creative. It's not like it creates super fun situations. It's like, oh, that is, that's great slapstick. It never no. <laughs> It never works. It, it never, never feels works. good. It's super just like... half it, It's like demeaning. It feels half-assed. Yeah. yeah, it feels super half-assed. And it's it's super lazy humor. It's not funny. And uh, it does the character an enormous disservice. So you don't need this Fire Force. Like, why stick to these lame, unfunny, horseshit running gags? I don't understand it. It might be a show thing. I mean, One Piece also sticks to some running jokes. It's like... Zoro always loses uh, his uh, his way. He is bad with directions, so he always ends up where he isn't supposed to. Sanji Sanji always is lettering on women and everything, and uh, Usopp is always lying and shit like that, and is also a scaredy cat. So, you know, they always do something with that. But, you know, if that gets overdone, it's annoying as well. And mm. I've said this before. But Fire Force is even worse about that, because... There are some parts in One Piece where these tropes work, where these tropes are still funny because Oda can create some funny creations with these tropes. But Fire Emblem Forest really can't when it comes to this Tamaki Lucky Ledger shit. It doesn't work. And the only running gag that is great in this show is Arthur because they get creative with the forms his delusions and idiocy take. Yes. Oh. They are not lazy with that stuff. And that's the difference between him and Tamaki. Tamaki is always the same jokes. Uh, literally the exact same joke like she she suddenly loses her clothes out of nowhere and then accidentally jumps a guy or whatever and then she's embarrassed and the guy is kind of happy but also embarrassed and shit like that 
And with Arthur, you get a bunch of different things where it's like, now I'm part of the round table and now my weird sick horse is actually a steed and shit like that. And or whatever, my trustworthy donkey. You know, they, like I said, that, sh that shit is creative and that shit is funny and uh, it surprises you. And Tamaki's shit doesn't surprise you. It's just boring and it's lazy and it's unfunny. Mm. And yeah, so that's why I love... That's why I love Arthur. That's why I hate Tamaki. It's not her fault. Like, it's just the writer's fault. <laughs> it's like at, at one point, at one point, she literally says, I am pathetic. All I ever do is have others protect me. It's not your fault, Tamaki. The writer is to blame. Because <laughs> I, I, I do feel bad for her because she has, like, you know, a legit moment with Juggernaut. And then it's like... <sighs> Back mm. to the old bullshit. Yeah. And I mean, she finally gets some development in the penultimate episode of the season. Took you long enough, Fire Force. But they need to follow that up with some actual development and not rely on those stupid fucking jokes for her anymore. I really, that's probably the thing I want most from season three. Aside from all the, you know, oh, what is behind this? More plot relations. Give me, give, give me more development for our core characters. Also, that also plays into this. But. Please, 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 Okubo, stop it with this stupid, stupid, with these stupid, stupid jokes. They are not funny. They're garbage. So if anything, if we can get anything from season three, just... You, and you can easily cut that shit out. It's not like, hey, it's in a manga, so we have to put it in the TV show. Just fucking, that's what an adaption is for. Mm -hmm. You subtract the parts that don't work and maybe add some parts in that, that enrich the experience and leave everything else that already worked as it is. So we got a clear thing that doesn't work in this show or didn't work in the source material. So take it out. We don't need it. It's filler and it's lame and it's garbage and it's boring. And it's demeaning to the character, and it doesn't do anything for, good for the show. So fucking get it out of here. I, it, <laughs> I don't want it, and uh, we don't definitely don't need it. So yeah, mm. uh, one can only hope. But I don't want to end on a negative note. So let's highlight a few more random positive things in this season that I enjoyed. Talking about visuals again, the Sakuga in the first episode was bonkers, and there's a bunch more where that came from. Like I said, the fight uh, against Karon is amazing. Like the fights between Joker, Benny Maro, and the Holy Soul Temple is amazing. Uh, the Juggernaut fight is great, and we got a lot, lot of, lot more shit. Just in terms of visuals, hey, if you like your show in action, fucking watch Fire Force. You will have a good time. The sound, again, sound editing is fantastic and impactful in this show. I love it to death. Um, we get a comedic bit in the beginning. Where the girls read out Shinra, which was hilarious, and so was the nude calendar uh, that we got. God. That was actually that was a clever that was a clever nude joke. That was a clever sexy joke. Mm. I enjoyed that. Thank you. At least you got creative with that. But also, again, that didn't relate to Tamaki. So why am I even surprised? <laughs> so, like I said, uh, in terms of visuals, there is at least one impressively animated and choreographed action scene in almost every episode. And like we mentioned before, Shinra throwing Karo through the building looked amazing. There is this great scene where they drive this truck um, with, with the with the mounted gun, and it turns out Obi is bad at shooting video games, so Vulcan compensates by ramming it into the target. Yes! <laughs> so he can just for point blank fucking unload. It's great. I like it. <laughs> oh, and that was so good. Yeah, I think the director of Diamond's uh, is Unbreakable storyboard, at least part of that episode, mm. which I think showed in certain parts. And yeah, again... The show is beautiful, not only in the fight scenes, like the night scenes in episode 11 are a highlight in my opinion. Like the city looks just great. Yeah, Everything has a kind of muted glow to it, which is a nice change of pace compared to the cartoony, hyper colorful comic book visuals, you know, with big explosions uh, and everything throughout the majority of the show. So the show can, Fire Force can do both. And uh, I really appreciated that. Some of the backdrops, uh, backdrops in this show are gorgeous. Like, for example, the scenery in the episode where Shinra and Iris go to the baptism church. Like, it's this very beautiful, colorful, very clean look with the water around it and everything. That's also really nice. And last but not least, of course, there's a Soul Eater reference mm. in the same episode. Even twice, I would say. The bar 
Um, Assault goes to for research, has Death Scythe sitting at the table next to him, complaining that his daughter, uh, which is Marka, which is one of the main characters from Soul Eater, doesn't want to have anything to do with him, which is like a running gag in uh, in uh, in Soul Eater, where uh, you know this guy Death Scythe is a shitty father, basically to oh, his daughter Marka. Well, I missed he- that entirely because I don't I don't know like basically nothing about Soul Eater. Yeah, that's why I bring it up because uh, that jumped out to me immediately. It was like, oh, Marka, I'm so sorry. And she hates me. My daughter hates me, but I try my best. And he does. He does an original show. But the problem is he's a ladies man. And he, you know, he hangs out at, at a bar with ladies on a, with hostesses on a regular basis. And his daughter doesn't really like that. So she calls him a shitty dad all the time, even though he's the literal death scythe of the Grim Reaper in Soul Eater. He's a cool guy. But uh, yeah, they're, you know. It's all about transforming weapons in that and everything who are actually uh, people or people who are imbued with the souls of, of weapons and everything. But yeah, it's uh, that was just a neat bit, that being in there and like, hey! <laughs> One of the references we, ta- references we talked about. Like like you said, you didn't think anything of it because you didn't know Soul Eater and it wasn't like super in your face. It was just a nice side gag with Death Scythe sitting next one um, compartment next to to uh, our actually our character from from Fire Force, and just complaining about his daughter not liking him. <laughs> <laughs> but then they dropped something else on us at the very end of yes. the season, which was the moon from Soul uh-huh. Eater. Which yes, I, I wonder, which makes me wonder how Fire Force connects to Soul Eater, or if they're just trying to say that Fire Force is the sun to Soul Eater's moon, or something like that. I don't, I don't know. Maybe. I wonder. I wonder if they will follow up on that in some regard. If there, if there will be some more connections to Soul Eater. If they actually do a weird crossover thing at some point, I would be super surprised. I don't expect that to happen because those universes are so completely different, and I don't see there, aside from dimension hopping, maybe there any be any real. I feel like their side being there was just a you know side gag. He's not really supposed to be that character, but he's just a a reference in there. They, they, I don't think they actually share a universe. That would be super weird. Yeah. Because Soul Eater has this weird Halloween-esque world and nothing nothing in the world of Fire Force looks like that. So I don't... And I don't think part of any part of the uh, rest of the world looks like that. So I, I can't see that happening. So I think it was just there for funsies, just for people who are um, uh, acquainted with Okubo's earlier work. So, uh, yeah, I... I appreciated it. I don't think they will do anything more with that than they, what they did in the season. Maybe a bit more references. Maybe on the side you see maybe uh, maybe Kid or maybe Soul Eater or maybe Maka just standing around looking maybe at, uh, I don't know, of uh, a window in the shopping street or, st- or stuff like that. I can see something like that happening. But aside from that, I don't think they will really do anything with that story-wise. I would be very surprised if they do so. Well, if if they do, then I guess that means I gotta go back and watch and or read Soul Eater to get the full story. Not a bad idea. The problem is uh, the anime of Soul Eater looks fantastic because, of course, it's Bones. Mm. Uh, has has an original ending though, mm. so I don't know how much it diverges from the manga. But I think at a certain point it really does because the manga kept going for a while after the the anime was already wrapped up, if I'm not mistaken. So um, probably maybe watch the anime to a certain point and then keep on reading the manga might be the best choice because, you know, you get the nice visuals uh, shouldn't, that you shouldn't miss out on. Also, uh, a fantastic ending by Abington Boys School. And <laughs> yeah, Str- Strength is one of my favorite anime songs, period. I love that shit. It's amazing. And just the animation that uh, ED is amazing as well. So and the uh, first OP of... Um, and the second OP, both both of Soul Eater are also great. Like Paper Moon is a uh, uh, great, great uh, song as well. And it's also used in the actual show for a great moment of Black Star. Yeah, uh, <laughs> short advertisement for Soul Eater, but that <laughs> is definitely a fun show. And also on the visual side of things, really impressive and uh, easy on the eyes. But yeah. Um, I think uh, this season of Fire Force, um, as far as the plot was moving along it felt a lot more consistent throughout yes because because it's i can't really 
describe it because I'm doing it with my hands. But the first scene was kind of like it starts off real strong and they kind of dipped in the middle and then towards the end it picked up again. And, you know, it was nice to see that they were able to keep it, you know, exciting and interesting throughout this time. I think it's because it, this season had a different director. So I don't know. Really? I didn't pay attention to that. I don't know if that's like the, you know, the big thing that could have made it that difference but yeah the first season was directed by yuki yase and the second was directed by tatsuma minawi kawa so Mm. i mean it could also be that the manga at that point also got more streamlined and actually more focused focus more on the plot than actually introducing you know certain factions to you and certain characters although again second season throws a lot of new shit at us Mm. Uh, but at the same time it also reveals a lot more shit about its worth than its first season did which was more focused on actually setting up the whole thing and introducing us to our core set of characters with a lot of the uh, character people from the eighth company and everything and showing us how the world actually you know some parts of the you know the, the the fire force departments and everything works and and so on and yeah you're right I feel like Fire Force Season 2 felt a bit more, even though uh, it had a bunch of different factions, a bunch of different characters, felt a bit more straightforward, Mm. maybe, than the first season. And uh, also had the stronger story stuff. Like like I said before uh, in our review of the first season, first season felt great at the beginning, great at the end, but it kind of went a bit into a, let's say, valley or was not as enticing or not as interesting in its middle part because that's when Benny Morrow gets introduced, who is a cool character, don't get me wrong, but that part of the story wasn't as enticing to watch and felt more like of a sidestep and not actually moving forward. Uh, while in in season two, you constantly have the feeling that the show is moving forward in one way or another, at least for you know one faction. Uh, yeah. So, I agree. Uh, it was a cool season, definitely, and I'm going to keep on watching Fire Force, most definitely. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. I wonder what's going to happen next. I don't know if we get some definitive teases at the end of the season. The Soul Eater Moon doesn't count. <laughs> uh, so, I don't know. I don't know what, what's what's going to happen next. I assume we're going to get filled in more on, you know, what actually happened in the Great Cataclysm what Hijama's deal is, actually, what the Holy Soul Temple is maybe trying to do and stuff like that, what Burns' motivation is behind all of this. And, I mean, we know what the evangelists want to do, but uh, we still don't know all, all the pillars yet, and we don't really know anything about the first pillar, really, or that much anyway, and why she's so interested in uh, Shinra, aside from him being a pillar. Mm. But, yeah, so th- I expect a lot of that to be further revealed or uh, iterated on Season 3, so that's going to be a lot of fun, I assume. So, yeah, uh, where can people watch it if they want to catch up, John? Uh, you can watch it on Crunchyroll slash Verve, as they kind of share stuff back and forth. Uh, it's on Funimation. Uh, they've been kind of dubbing it. it. They haven't dubbed all of it yet, but I think the rest of it is coming soon uh it's also on hulu uh netflix depending on where you live and also on wakanim yes indeed so get on that if you like your show and action shows you can do a lot worse than fire force tamaki aside (laughs) this is a cool show with cool characters definitely and some really great fights and uh just great action in general and i was never bored I enjoyed the season from beginning to end and uh, David Production is doing their damnedest to make this look good. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's a lot of fun. If that is your genre like it is for me and like it is partially for John, go for it. I'm pretty sure you will enjoy it. So, uh, speaking of enjoying things, (laughs) I think there's still one little thing we have to do. Best of the season. All right, best of the season time, everybody. John, what do you feel like? What? Uh, how do you feel about the shows uh, that we had this season? What is your What is your impression? What do you think? We had a Where lot. is your mind wandering? We had a lot of good stuff this season. We did. We did. We didn't have that many reviews, but most of what we watched was pretty damn great. So. It's tough for me. Maybe I go first for a change. I think you always go first. 
Yeah, y- yes, please. And then I can <laughs> I can figure it out. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Let's start with Golden Kamui, which I love. I always like Golden Kamui. I always love Golden Kamui to an extent. I feel like it wasn't as consistently hype as the second season for me. There was still lots to love in the third season. There was still lots of cool stuff, uh, lots of cool stuff, a lot of cool characters, a lot of cool revelations. Um, I don't know. We have given that award to Golden Kamui before, and I don't know. I want to give it to Golden Kamui again for this season, considering the other contenders. So yeah, I mean, I've, I've given it to it twice because yeah. because it deserved it, but uh. it definitely did. It definitely did. But it's 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 tough. So yeah, not this time, Golden Kamui. I guess even though in any other season you might have deserved it again. Um. Fire Force Season 2, like we just elaborated on, was a lot of fun as well. But in the face of, again, the other contenders on this list, it doesn't feel like the right choice because it's also still going, because it's, you know, a basic shonen thing, which is not a bad thing, don't get me wrong. But, you know, it's it's a tried and true formula, and it's also like, hey, parts of this we have maybe seen before and even done better in certain parts. And yeah, I think we both enjoyed it a lot. But again, given what other shows we watched, I don't feel it doesn't feel right to give it best of the season. So for me, it either comes down to Haikyuu or Akudama Drive. And I'm still wavering. I might depend on what John chooses ultimately. Um, Haikyuu already got my first, my very first best of the season award ever mm. for its third season which was arguably a bit better than season four. But regardless, it's still the best sports anime I've ever watched so far. So it's more than deserving of a second award, maybe. And I really like what they did with Hinata in this season. I really uh, like what they did with Kageyama. I liked what they did with the opposing teams. I think um, the Foxes were a great team. I think what they did with Nikuma was great, um, and that's probably gonna be even better in the fifth season, which is also why I'm like, yeah, maybe not this season, because season five, being mainly about the long-awaited fight between Nikuma and Karosuno, I can't even see anything else unless it's, I don't know, maybe a really strong season of My Hero Academia or... I don't know, super surprised that I couldn't see anyone taking that award from Haikyuu in that season. Uh, so, if we get that, let's hope. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm i probably gonna give my best of the season award this time to Akudama Drive. It's a unique anime original show, which are far and few between anyways. And it oozes... A lot of passion and throws a bunch of cool characters, twists, and themes at you. It has a cool, pretty smart story, you know, that pays homage to a lot of cyberpunk tropes. Uh, you get the feeling that both the writer and the director were in love with movies and tried to make it, you know, not annoying, but put their love in this show and try to use it in a way that made sense for that material. And... Yeah, it also looks fucking great. <laughs> mm. And I love small, powerful shows that come out of nowhere and rock my anime world, and this is definitely one of those. So I'm going to give my best of season one to Akudama Drive, and I feel very good about it. And I think if you can get your hand on the show in an uncensored form, that is the show I would recommend you definitely watch from this season. Because, like I said, it's a lot of fun, great characters, Cool plot, cool action from beginning to end, cool visuals, like really creative, stylish uh, visuals, great soundtrack, like just the whole package in like this this small 12 episode long show that you can basically binge if you start early enough on a Saturday on a, or on a Sunday and you will have a good time. So yeah, I, I, think, I think Akudama Drive is very deserving of the Best of the Season award when it comes to my choice, but John... What is your ultimate decision? Well, three of the shows you listed are on my short list as well. What a surprise. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I agree with you on Fire Force and Golden Kamui. Like, I could easily just be like, yes, yes, Golden Kamui. Because I think it's just 
awesome. I think it's so much fun in just oh, this fucking thrill ride of a show. And, you know, like I said, there's, there's still more to go with Fire Force as well, mm-hmm. obviously. There, there's still more to go with both shows, really. Yes, um, absolutely. Akudama Drive came along. It was It's this nice self-encapsulated story. And that was like obviously fill, filled with love for the production. And then and then I was surprised. I was surprised by Talentless Nana. <laughs> and I liked that show a lot too. And I want more of that as well. Three of the shows on my list I just want more of. That's a good sign. So it comes down to what do I want more of the most? And I think it's kind of a foregone conclusion that there's going to be a fourth season of Golden Comedy. There's going to be a third season of Fire Force. Both of them are really big, really popular, really great shows. Mm. Um, and Akudama Drive was super good, too. And I really enjoyed the hell out of that. But since this is a show about letting us have our cake and eat it, too, mm. I think I'm going to swerve a little bit. And pick the one that intrigued me the most is probably not going to get a second season, but I definitely want to see more of it. I'm going to pick Talentless and Anna. Interesting. I didn't expect that. I would have expected you to pick uh, Golden Kamari honest, uh, again, honestly. So I mean, honestly, that should be the pick, but just... Fuck, I went into Talentless Nana being, and, and I said this when I reviewed it, being like, oh, this is just going to be Index for Kids. Oh, no. Oh, it's more than that, boy. Oh, and I was like, fuck, this was really good. It was way more interesting than I thought, and I want more of that. I want to see where the story goes. Like, there's there's real weird shit with Nana's past where she got fucked up over her parents' death. And there's, you know, this the shadow organization that's uh, pulling the strings on her actions. I want to know more about that stuff. I want more of that. So it got the hooks in me way harder than I was expecting. And that's what I want. That's what I'm giving my award to because it just had the intrigue and the strength to keep me going from week to week. The list of shows that you uh, love that I still need to watch grows plays further than the universe still being on top there and uh, oh. you know, followed by Talentless Nana now. So, <laughs> But I'll get to it uh, once I'm done past Black Clover, I guess. That's there are true. a bunch of shows I want to check out that, I don't, that I'm not going to review, but that I still want to watch because I've heard good things about them. So yeah, Talentless Nana now is on the list as well. And apparently now it's on our best of the season list. So, all right, if you want to have to decide between for you know watching two shows this season uh, from this season or only two shows you only have the time for two shows you can't go wrong with akudama drive and Terrence nana because those are both fun shows and john and i explained to you why in detail uh in full reviews and again in this best of the season segment so check out those two shows check out any of the other shows that we reviewed that uh where you liked what you heard and uh, yeah, that's it for Anime Brain Freeze for this season. Not as many episodes as in other seasons, but that might change again next season. We don't know yet how many we, uh, actual reviews we're going to have there, but there are a bunch of shows that we watched. So who knows? Might be more episodes again. Then we'll see you or <laughs> we'll talk to you again once the premieres for spring roll around and we're going to do our, uh, we're going to do our sneak peek and our first review from winter season. So look forward to that. Until then stay i guess warm since it's still really cold here <laughs> and yeah uh as usual stay healthy wear a mask and uh if you can get a vaccination shot please try to do so and uh, let's hope we can get out of this mess uh by the end of this year and uh yeah it would be nice to actually go to an anime con at some point again hopefully so, maybe next year yeah we'll see uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, talk to you soon and see you and Fresh Anime next season. Bye. See ya.
And that is a wrap on the 109th episode of Anime Brain Freeze. All the music in our show is from the Double Dragon Neon soundtrack by the amazing Jake Kaufman. Please go to vrit.bandcamp.com and check out his awesome work. Our show is available on most of the popular podcast services, but it's always worth visiting animebrainfreeze.com for our review index and more. Leave us comments and questions on YouTube, follow us on Twitter at AnyBrainFreeze, or send an email to animebrainfreeze at gmail.com. We would love to read your feedback. Thanks for tuning in, we hope you had a good time, and please join us again on our next episode. Mach's gut? So long, everybody. Next time on Anime Break Freeze! Break the curse, live to love. And become the Sorcerer Supreme!